Sound sound check, sound check. Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, good to see you all uh, here uh, virtually. Uh, Ryan tells me there's uh, 60 or 70 of you, 80 of you out there uh, in uh, on the interwebs watching uh, Kim One early on a Monday morning. So uh, last time we were talking about uh, measuring the actual uh, energies that we've been talking about the entire semester. So we did it in calorimetry. And when you use a calorimeter, you do a chemical reaction inside a fixed flask. And you often fix the volume of that flask. So it's called a bomb calorimeter. It doesn't explode on you. But it's not allowed to do any work. So it can't expand. So the, heat, the transfers between the system and the surroundings are limited to heat transfers. So you can get uh, accurate indication of the energy change because it all has to occur as heat transfer. So heat transfers from uh, your test system, it transfers out into a water bath and you monitor the temperature of the water bath. If it increases, then there's energy being released from the reaction and you can tell how much heat by using the heat capacity of the system and the temperature change. So uh, Q equals Cp delta T. And in this case, the heat capacity 
uh, if you're if everything's perfect, you could say that's just the water. But of course, everything in the calorimeter uh, absorbs heat. So you generally, this is the heat capacity of the entire calorimeter. Uh, first approximation, it's the water uh, inside. <clears throat> we talked about the origin of the uh, ways that uh, heat can be, excuse me, energy can be maintained in a system. So this is energy maintenance and release. So this is the processing of energy within the solution. Heat, remember, simply is traveling in and out. So heat is the transfer of energy. It's the energy that's accompl accomplishing these rotations, these vibrations, uh, intermolecular forces breaking, and even when you do a chemical reaction, the breaking and formation of bonds, which we're going to talk about a lot today. We looked at the difference uh, in those kinetic uh, interactions. So interactions that are involve the random motion of uh, particles. So if there's a random motion of particles, that generally corresponds simply to an increase in temperature. If there's a potential change, so some kind of work has to be done, that is associated with uh, often a phase change in systems. They're the classic system where you're gaining purely potential energy because during a phase change, the temperature does not change. It's one of the great mysteries of the universe that you can boil water. The water, liquid water itself, stays at 100 degrees, even though you're pouring heat into it as fast as you can. It stays at 100 while it's boiling. In fact, we were talking about baking and cooking the other day, and that is uh, an issue people sometimes use. So if you want to fix something at 100 degrees, cook exactly at 100 degrees, you could do it in a boiling water bath because that'll heat the entire system to 100 degrees and then start boiling and stay at 100 degrees until all the water has boiled off. So it's great at regulating temperature. It can have the reverse effect, sometimes a, a effect you don't want to happen, and that is you're trying to get something very hot, but the water, if it's wet, if there's water in it, then water absorbs heat so well that it uh, can sequester the heat you're applying to itself, and it'll hold the temperature of the whole system at 100 until it boils off. So trying to get the temperature above the 100 degrees, you need to get rid of the water. You need to have a dry system. So <clears throat> interesting baking technique. Um, it, for instance, if your bread dough is too wet, if you're watching the great British uh, baking show, uh, Paul Hollywood would tell you, uh, this is definitely underproofed. <laughs> so if your dough's too wet when it gets in the oven, it takes too long to get to the temperature you'd like because it's taking too long for the water to evaporate. So it, you don't get the same kind of bake well, you got a good bake on that. <laughs> I'm probably the only one that watches the Great British Baking Show. Um, but any baking show, you get a good bake if your water content is precise so that the water evaporates off and that comes to 320 degrees or whatever you want to bake your bread at and stays there for the right amount of time. So <clears throat> let's uh, continue. So we're going to uh, track energy now, and we've done this already. We said uh, if you have a, a thermodynamic cycle that you would be able to uh, start at one state. And if you went around a cycle, that all these enthalpies delta H1, delta H2, and delta H3 have to add to zero because initial and final state are the same. So 
delta H final minus delta N H initial for this state is zero. Enthalpy is the same. So there's a handy relationship between those three. And uh, same can be said if I, uh, if I go the other way around. Can I get a bigger eraser? There we go. The same can be said uh, in a, uh, uh, a slightly different way. Say um, this path here, I'm going to go back to my pen. If that's the path you're interested in, then that path is the sum of these two paths. So to get to here, there's two pathways. I can go along the red pathway to get there, do this step, and then this step. So step one, step two, step one plus plus step two has to add to step three because everybody ended up here. This was just a different way to get from state one to state three. And we looked at that when we were looking at, uh, this was important if we were gonna set a zero somewhere. So we could take all these compounds relative to each other because we know we can go by any pathway and calculate a state function even if it's a pathway that you just imagine. So you could imagine a pathway where you break every compound up into its elements in the gas phase, and then they recombine in the gas phase down to form your products. So your reactants, elements in the gas phase, down to products. That's probably not how the re reaction goes. Say that's this pathway. Step one, breaking it into atoms, and then step two, making the, the compounds from the atoms. That's probably not how it goes, but if you can imagine it, it's a possible state, and enthalpy is a state function. So getting from here to here does not matter how you get there. So you can just imagine one. So the beauty of a state function, you have freedom to pick the path it can be an imagined path, it can be a convenient path, but the difference between state one and state three here is delta H3, period. Doesn't matter how you got there. So let's use that. So here's the uh, combustion of methane. So I uh, burn methane in oxygen, I get carbon dioxide in water, releases delta H negative 890 kilojoules for a mole of methane. So I can put the reactants and the products on this plot. And if I put the reactants and the products on this plot, delta H1, this is the one I'm interested in, is 890 kilojoules. The spacing there is 890 kilojoules. That's an energy. If I go in this direction, it releases that energy. Maybe all of it is heat. If I go in this direction, it absorbs that energy. So delta H has a magnitude, the difference between those two, and it has a sign, negative, if you're reducing energy in the system, and positive if you're increasing energy in the system. And that's kind of intuitive. Negative heat flows reduce the energy. Positive heat flows increase the energy. So let's look at some of the other uh, aspects of this reaction. Notice I formed water liquid. That's not in its standard state. And if we want to use delta H of formation to calculate this, and we saw last time, we could take delta H's of formation of the products minus delta H's of formation of the reactants, and that would give us delta H for the reaction but they have to be in their standard states. It has to be, uh, oh, that is, sorry. Did I say that completely wrong? I think I looked at the, the gas. Uh, liquid water is the standard state of water. It's uh, one atmosphere pressure and 25 degrees C. That's how you would find water. 
uh, liquid water, and you would find uh, carbon dioxide as gas, oxygen as gas, and methane as gas. So these are at their standard states. And if everything is at one atmosphere of pressure, and the water is present as liquid, liquids and solids just have to be present in their uh, pure form, then that is the energy difference between that. So it's not an energy difference uh, for every set of combinations we have. If we get an enthalpy, and if we're calling it a standard enthalpy, then that standard enthalpy has to be everybody's in this artificial situation where all gases are at one atmosphere and all solids and liquids are at in their pure state. Anything that's dissolved in water or another solvent has to be at one molar. So one, one, one for everything. There's no such thing as one for a pure solid or liquid. They just have to be there. So that's an artificial condition. And, and it's one atmosphere of all these things, even though that's not the balanced stoichiometric coefficients. It's one atmosphere of everything. That's the energy difference between these things. Because you're not going to let the reaction go. You're saying, I want to know the net difference between these guys in their standard states and these guys in their standard states before any reaction occurs. So if you actually do the reaction, You'll, you'll get a different number if everything is at uh, their standard states. You see that already because one atmosphere of methane and two atmospheres of oxygen, the methane is going to run out. The, carbon, uh, the oxygen is limiting the reaction. So if you actually do the reaction and measure that, you're not going to get from its standard state. You're not going to get 890 kilojoules per mole. These are just relative things. And we do that so we can compare one set of conditions to another. Would not be fair to compare this reaction to that reaction if methane was half an atmosphere in this one and two atmospheres in this one. So we have those standard states for a reason. So we can use enthalpies that are all relative to the same thing, the elements in their standard states, and we can add and subtract them and get to different points knowing that everybody, every stopping point along the way are the elements or the compounds in their standard states. That's very counterintuitive when you start uh, in uh, Chem 1, that these numbers are not for running the reaction. You say, oh, when I run the reaction, that's what I get. That's not what we're saying. We're saying there's an enthalpy difference between these two things in their standard states. When you run the reaction, it depends on what you have. So if you take nothing else home from Chem 1, take home the fact that standard state conditions, standard state enthalpy differences, are this artificial difference between the two. If I put that in the calorimeter and I run it, I do not get that number. Because only half a mole of that methane is going to react. you'd probably get something like half that number. So <clears throat> uh, here's another reaction. Same thing except for I form gaseous water. And I'm curious what that standard enthalpy difference is. Well, I think you can know we could be pretty clever. Here is that relative to this. And I know that because I know Carbon dioxide, gas, same in both of them. All I have to do to get from this state to this state is boil the water. So I know the enthalpy, standard enthalpy of vaporization of water. So I can put delta H2, the enthalpy of vaporization of water, and we look at that all the time. And we can add that in there. Now, I can uh, simply add these two, add to this one, and we knew that had to be the case. So that means this enthalpy change, which is the enthalpy change for this one, 
So this second reaction is we're interested in this one still, but that one has to be the sum of those two. And it's the sum of those two reactions. Yes. Does this mean that whenever we calculate enthalpy of the reaction, we can use a balanced or unbalanced equation? Uh, oh, that's brilliant. Uh, so, uh, brilliant. Yes. So somebody said, <laughs> if we're going to calculate energies, the question is, do I use the balanced or the unbalanced equation? Uh, if you're going to use enthalpies of formation, and so if I took enthalpies of formation for products and reactants, I do account. There's two moles of this, and there's one, uh, two moles of that in there. But you, so to get enthalpies of formation, I have to do that. And here's kind of why. I have to, if I'm going to add reactions together, those stoichiometric coefficients have to cancel. So I have to say those two moles of water are canceled by this, these two moles of water over here. So I have to do that. So this number you recognize as twice the standard enthalpy of formation of, of gaseous water. When you boil water per mole, it's 44-ish kilojoules per mole. I'm going to do two. Uh, so that gives me a, uh, uh, a difference there. But it would be liquid water, if you looked it up in a table, it would be liquid water, pure, and gaseous water at one atmosphere above that, the standard state for vaporizing it. So uh, you can look up the standard state for vaporization. The standard state for vaporization is for one mole. So uh, you would multiply that standard state vaporization for one mole times two. Just like this is the standard state, uh, if I got that delta H1 from products minus reactants, and I was going to actually burn two moles, then I'd have to multiply that by two. So I can see the source of confusion there. So you'll have to sit back and say, am I just trying to get a standard state so I can add reactions together? I can get the standard state, but if I'm going to then go add them, I got to then I have to take care of these coefficients. So I do have to multiply that one by uh, two. Interesting side note, 84 kilojoules per mole there. You notice when we're talking about the vaporization of water, we get, we've given actually a bunch of different values. We've given 44 kilojoules per mole at times, 40 kilojoules per mole at times, 42 kilojoules per mole at times. And we're doing that because those were all at different temperatures. If you have to boil, if you have to vaporize water under standard conditions, 25 degrees C, that takes more energy than boiling it at 100 degrees C. So we take into account that that water and that water, we're going to say they're at 25 degrees C. So to boil water at 25 degrees C, that's the number we need to know. Yes, question. Uh, there are a bunch. There are two. Um, so you said a minute ago that only half a mole of CH4 would react in the actual experiment. Can you say again why that would be? Uh, if I did this, this chemical reaction, then uh, did I say half a mole? You said half. I think you meant Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes, I said that wrong. Thank you. If this, cal if this calculation went, you would burn up that entire mole of methane because you have two, you have excess uh, uh, oxygen or you have the right amount of oxygen. So you would burn up that entire mole. I'm sorry. Um, if you had standard states exactly, then you'd have one atmosphere of this and one atmosphere of this. And then that's the standard state enthalpy difference between those. So there's a difference between the reaction enthalpy and the standard state enthalpy difference between the products and reactants. And that's what we're getting at. That's the source of confusion here. When you 
have a chemical reaction and you take, we saw that formula last time, you take up, you add the enthalpies of formation of the products, you subtract away the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. That means everything was in its standard state. Everything was it with one atmosphere of pressure since they're all gases and water was there at liquid. And I'm saying that's an artificial state. So if you ran the reaction, you actually put it in those conditions, standard state conditions, then you burned it, you would have half a mole of methane because you only have one atmosphere of oxygen in there. Yes. So the question is just a generic one. Uh, where do these two numbers come from? Do I calculate them or are, am I given them? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so in general, when you're working with these, you'll have a table of standard enthalpies of formation. You don't have to calculate standard enthalpies of formation. So you have standard enthalpies of formation of all these things, then you can calculate that number. Or I can give you that number and you can do kind of a an interaction like we're doing here where i'm going to add two together to get a third so uh the answer is and that's a very good question i mean when do i calculate and when do i not this whole idea of enthalpies of uh standard enthalpies of formation of the products minus standard enthalpies of formation of the reactants are the way you're going to calculate enthalpies for reactions. So that you can take to the bank. If I don't give you one, you're going to have to probably use that or construct it from some pathway that you can make. But you have to be able to get these pieces of information. So they'll either be given or you can calculate them. And now that I've uh, written this up there, we've talked about it for a bit. I haven't, I didn't write the degree signs there. Okay. And uh, that means this is probably not, since I didn't write it, uh, somebody can go check. This is probably not the standard uh, enthalpy for that reaction. It's probably the enthalpy where all the methane reacts. So it's probably twice the number you would get from standard enthalpies of formation of products minus standard enthalpies. Uh, and I will do that. I'll be very careful. If it came from subtracting enthalpies of formation uh, minus of the products minus the reactant, that little degree sign will appear there. And obviously, it doesn't appear on the second one um, because we know that number. Uh, that's what we were just talking about. We know the standard enthalpy of formation of the gaseous water is 40-ish, 42 kilojoules per mole at standard state. So that is definitely not. And that leads me to believe that one isn't either. Nevertheless, everything we've said is still true. Uh, this may be exactly the enthalpy for that reaction and not the standard state. In fact, shouldn't really be the standard state to do this because you are accounting for the exact conditions. So, uh, and that's, that is how you should differentiate. Am I calculating, am I accounting for exactly the conditions that are where the reaction is gonna go? If I, if I account for the, exactly the conditions that the reactions are gonna go and you want this to go to completion, you have to have twice as many atmospheres of oxygen as you do of methane. But in the standard state difference, there's one. OK? Uh, just, I know, scratch your heads about this. And I apologize. It sounds like I said it. I might have said it backwards uh, uh, once, uh, at least. Um, so thank you for catching me, of course. And um, uh, you can look at this in your notes and in uh, the uh, text that we provide you. Um, in the PRISM software, or of course, go to a reliable online textbook for free. There's the LibreText textbooks 
that uh, we're providing you. That's where the notes that we're taking come from. So uh, I took way too long on this. We're not going to get very far today, but it's important that you know these difference because on the exam, I'm going to be a stickler about whether it's standard state energy difference or the reaction energy difference. Okay, so the delta H of reaction is different from the delta H, uh, the standard enthalpy difference between the two. The standard enthalpy difference between the two is everything's on standard conditions. You have products there. The reaction, you don't start with products there. You do the reaction. So the reaction one, you have to either measure or get from uh, this kind of combination. So <clears throat> delta H3, the one I want, is obviously the sum of those two. Delta H3, I go from here to here. That's one pathway to get from here, to get to here. The other pathway to get uh, to there is going straight to there. Doesn't matter if I start here and end here. Doesn't matter how I got there. Delta H3 is always the same. That's the beauty of the state function. Path independent functions, work and heat, who knows? You could have gone any amount of heat absorbed. You could have even gone down to the uh, breaking this up into atoms and come back here at lots of heat, do work and come around. So let's, uh, I'll talk this uh, through. Is this a good talk through one? Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just talk this through you. What, what is the relationship between uh, the energies released? Uh, is it interesting? Uh, oh, actually, sketch yeah, sketch this one out because this is uh, this is uh, straightforward application. Of what we just did. So go ahead, draw the energy levels uh, for these various things. You can do it in a relatively simple way, and see if you can tell me. I want the energy difference between uh, the relationship between delta H one, this chemical reaction, and delta H two, this chemical reaction. So C, with the information there, if you can uh, figure out what's going on. Brian, are you ready? I'll give you the set of four. And I will join, <coughs> I will join a uh, breakout room. Oh, poop.
All right, let's see what you're thinking. Uh, we have um, many of our votes are in. So we'll see what you have here. Ah, I hate that PowerPoint thing. Uh, move it to move this to the center of the screen, um, and see if we get a little better. Uh, we're totally uh, confused about that. Nobody has a. Uh, we haven't converged anywhere. So uh, I'll give you my thinking on that. <clears throat> so the question was, how do I? arrange these oh am i not going to get the answer oh yeah the question was how do i arrange uh maybe the slides aren't in the right order are the slides in the right order is the answer coming up no oh, you have powerpoint <laughs> problems i will look stand by um uh that's the one we're at Uh, stand by, guys. I think the, uh, there's a um, mix up in the um, uh, uh, PowerPoint order. We will go to black screen and I'll figure it out. Stand by one thing. Um, I don't know where the answer is. Um, uh, okay, uh, we'll just have to work it out in real time because I don't see the answer. Um, am I on? Okay, you can hear me mumbling here. Um, uh, um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Sometimes the, sometimes it just gets shuffled to the end. Let me just uh, see if it's near the end of the presentation. What we'll probably be doing, we'll go through the rest of the presentation and we'll just see that one randomly show up. Uh, I don't. So let's go here and uh, we'll restart the presentation. Ding. Uh -huh. Okay, there it is. I will screenshot it. And I will take it over to the blackboard so that I can make it a little smaller and talk about it. <clears throat> so we have acetylene gas burning in oxygen gas to form carbon dioxide and water gas. So that is not the standard state, it's water gas. So I can put that somewhere on the state. So I have uh, everything in gas, C2H2 gas, and I have uh, the oxygen gas, and that burns. I know that's exothermic. So I can put that the, the direction there. I don't know what the magnitude is, but this is CO2 gas, but it's also water gas. And that's an uh, important consideration. Now this one, I have the same starting conditions, but I go to liquid water. So if I have to go to liquid water, so I can write the relationship between those two 
because that has to be down here. CO2 gas plus H2O liquid because this difference I know is 44 kilojoules or something like that if it's a mole of water evaporating. And I want to know uh, this one. So same starting conditions, but going to the liquid. So that's this one. So the question is, how does this one, big one here, uh, relate to the uh, other two? So is delta H1 bigger or smaller than delta H2? So let's put delta H2 is going to the water. This is delta H2. Delta H1 is going to the gas. So there it is, black and white. Delta H2 bigger than delta H1. OK? Wonderful. I love using the board uh, like that. Uh, we'll have to record that segment. We are recording that segment. We'll have to try to use that in some promotional material. I should write neater. That would be better, <laughs> too. Uh, my mom's fault. <laughs> she didn't stay on me. Uh, OK, so <clears throat> let's continue We're running. Uh, quite a bit behind here this morning. Um, let's can. Oh no, there's more questions. <laughs> Even more behind. Okay, uh, I'm confused about why the standards of the temperature is useful if it cannot be observed in the lab. So if it's just other than one, and if it doesn't allow you to correctly add reactions, so what's the point? So the question is, and this is this is the same source of confusion. So um, the question is, why are these standard enthalpy enthalpies of reaction useful if, uh, if, if what? The, um, well, forget it. I'll just tell you why they're useful. They're useful because that is how we compare one thing to another thing. So we have to have everybody in the same states to compare this guy to this guy. So those are standard enthalpies of formation. If you do the reaction. So everything is at one molar up in this one. Everything is at one molar in this one. You can get that standard enthalpy difference between the two. And you'll often be asked just to do that. But if you do the reactions, then you have to take into account the coefficients. The coefficients don't matter for the standard enthalpy difference. It's everything's at one atmosphere and everything's at one molar. So they, they matter with, to, to the respect that you use them to calculate the standard enthalpy difference. But then you're at this artificial state of uh, being where you've calculated an enthalpy difference, but it's for this crazy state where everything is at one atmosphere and one molar. But that's good because you can compare it to other things where everything is at one atmosphere and one molar at 25 degrees C. If you want to use that to find a chemical reaction, then you can say, well, let me look at how much of those reactants I actually have and what my initial conditions are and if the reaction will go. And then I can use, calculate a reaction energy. So this whole deal of why do I have the standard ones? I have the standard ones so I can have a giant table of all compounds and compare all compounds to each other. But the compounds don't react to form one atmosphere of this and one molar of that every single time. But once I know those differences between them, those are absolute differences. Those are delta H's, absolute differences between them. So I can say then, well, I can say if that the difference between that and that is always that, then it doesn't matter which pathway I get from there to there. I can use that as my reference. Yes. So when you were doing the, the question, 
Because you have to already know that energy is formation for each of the substances, and do they have to do the problem without the chart of energy for formation? The last chem quiz? Yes, and can you do the last chem quiz is could I, I? I just did it without, without um, the uh, enthalpies of formation. Um, I just knew that that one was negative in some number. I don't, I don't care what delta H1 is, the actual number. I knew it was negative because that's a combustion. And we've told you a million times, you have to be aware, combustions give you carbon dioxide and water and they're exothermic. So that I knew I could draw. This one I could draw relative to each other because the only difference between those two is water liquid and water gas. And water liquid is lower in energy than water gas. So I can put both of those below both of these because the carbon dioxide is in the same state. Gas. So I can do that. I put 44 there. It didn't matter. All, all it matters is it's some number. It's this delta H I don't uh, know number. I don't know any of the delta H's. But then I said, well, if that's true, then going from this one to the liquid, so go, doing this bottom reaction, that has to be bigger because I go all the way down to the liquid phase. I don't have to know any of those numbers done by pictures. And you know I love you to do things by pictures. So the fewer numbers you have to calculate on an exam, the better. I'm going to ask you questions like this in pictures. Good question. What do the pictures mean? And there's, there's no way to, I mean, I've already, so I've gone through the pictures a, a million times. And you shouldn't expect that you get stuff in lecture. <laughs> there's only, there, there's many modes of learning. One of the modes of learning is going to the lecture and listening. It's not a particularly good one. Research shows that it doesn't matter how good the instructor is and how brilliant they produce stuff. If you go with a good instructor and a, a bad instructor, good presentation versus poor presentation, you can't tell the difference on overall outcomes for the students. It turns out they do about the same. That's because there's more than one mode of learning. So when the students have kind of that poorer instructor, they have to take it on themselves maybe to go do, get to do the extra reading. That's another mode. Another mode of learning is the chem quizzes. We talk to each other together. So there's homework, there's reading, there's going to lecture, there's talking to each other. All those things are modes of learning, watching videos online, thinking about things quietly by yourself. Those are all modes of learning. You have to use all of them and find which ones work for you and don't rely on me standing here for everything. In fact, I intentionally don't do everything. All I'm here to do is to motivate you to go use those other modes of learning. I hope I do that. <laughs> um, and I hope I don't cause more confusion than, than, uh, than I do... Um, uh, uh, then I uh, provide some uh, guidance and enlightenment. And uh, you know that I don't talk from notes. I just get up here and start talking. Um, so uh, I do make flubs. I do make verbal flubs. And this is always true. You've, you guys watch YouTubes all over the time. Uh, there's, there'll be little you know, boxes that pop up. You know, Mark meant to say this. It's just slips of the tongue that we have to put in there. Be great if you guys pointed out those slips in the tongue. <laughs> Maybe we should give you points for that make you real editors. Uh, so let's continue. Um, now we'll talk about uh, bonds in particular. We haven't talked about bond energies in particular. We've alluded to them and we've ranked them double bonds stronger than single bonds. But we haven't said uh, quantitatively that qualitative, this one's bigger than that one, is just a relationship thing. Quantitatively, you put a number associated with it. So uh, let's look at that. Oh, bonds. <laughs> oh, can I play that video? Um, so uh, we're running behind, so I won't. 
uh, uh, I won't play that video. I don't think it'll even play anyway. So um, this, uh, this video, I'll play it for you uh, next time. Or maybe I can find it really fast. Uh, it, I didn't put a link in there. So if I go here and I go to PowerPoint, and what's this lecture, bond energy? And I'm not even sure I can play it because it's got some copyrighted music in it. Um, so uh, here I am on Treasure Island one day. I had to get back uh, to give uh, Chem 1 exam. Bay Bridge was packed. So Agent Hogg, October 9, 2017. Agent 007 reporting for emergency concerns. With the midterm and Chem 1A rapidly approaching, I'll need to get to Berkeley as fast as possible. I can't risk being seen on the Bay Bridge. Fortunately, Q Branch has provided an alternative. Engaging submarine. Access code zero zero seven. Engage deep dive. I'll be in Berkeley in five minutes. Okay, so um, there we are racing in the uh, Tesla. I bet you didn't know uh, Tesla had the submarine feature until uh, you were looking there uh, today. And uh, here's our um, uh, our uh, daily driver. Uh, how do I get to the? Um, and I don't. I don't know if you noticed. Can I expand that? Oops. <laughs> um, the uh, license plate. Go back and watch the video. Um, the license plate on the car there. You'll probably appreciate it. Ryan would appreciate it. So let's talk about bond dissociation. That was bond, covalent bond. And what we have here are real chemical bonds. So uh, here's a here's a chemical X Y a single bond and we can break that up into X and Y and we've talked about doing that already uh, atomizing things uh, this might not be an atomization per se that bond could break in uh, liquid or some other conditions and here's the molecules held together there they are broken apart in this case into atoms so we broke that individual bond. There could have been other stuff attached to X and Y, but we're only talking about breaking that individual bond. That requires energy. If you take nothing else home from Chem 1A, take home the fact that breaking bonds always requires energy. You always have to put energy in. It's always endothermic. Have any of you guys had uh, some AP biology or biology out there? Uh, show of hands. <laughs> If you have biology classes, I haven't had one in a long time, but uh, they always talk about this molecule ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and that's an energy uh, storage molecule in uh, your body, and it's used in your cells to, as an energy transferred molecule. It's often written like this, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So you could write it as A-T-P-P-P to indicate those three phosphate bonds. And they always say that this is a high energy phosphate bond. And when you break that bond, energy is released. And that's how your cells power themselves, converting ATP to ADP. And we know now, I just told you, <laughs> if you take nothing else home from Kim Wan-Ant, on one A, it takes energy to break that bond. That bond itself is not high energy. In fact, it's low energy. It's easy to break. So the it's a it's a huge misnomer, and I hate seeing it in uh, biology textbooks. I'll I'll write to the um, uh, biology classes or the, or the biology GSIs, and I'll say. Uh, 
that doesn't, that is not a high energy bond. Actually, it turns out the overall reaction for breaking that bond is exothermic because other things happen. Other bonds are made that are stronger. And the separation of, there's a lot of negative charges here and a lot of negative charges there. That separation also, as you know, releases energy. So overall energy is released, but not from the bond breaking. It's the chemical reaction associated with the hydrolysis of ATP. So all the kinds of things going in there, you shouldn't focus on that bond. And I tell them, just put down hydrolysis of ATP as exothermic, not a high energy uh, phosphate bond. You can see I'm texting them. And <laughs> they, they say, well, can't we just say it's a high energy? And I go, no. And uh, there's all kinds of consternation involved. It's, then they're texting to each other, ah, Kubinek, angry face, angry face, poop emoji. <laughs> over the whole controversy over that particular bond. Bond energies, always uh, endothermic. In fact, we write bond energies as endothermic. So we always talk about the breaking reaction and not the forming reaction. But the forming reaction does, you could talk about it. Here I am forming uh, the bond from the broken molecule. And that energy will be the opposite of the bond energy. Here are some bond energies. I'm going to call them enthalpies now because it's uh, more proper to call them an, uh, an enthalpy. Uh, they are uh, reactions uh, that we, we catalog based on reactions in their standard state at one atmosphere of pressure. <clears throat> and you'll notice some things. 436, that's the energy of breaking a hydrogen bond. And that's exact. CLCL, chlorine-chlorine bond, that's the energy of breaking a chlorine bond. OO single bond, OO double bond. Now notice the OO double bond is more than twice the energy uh, bond enthalpy of the single bond. And that's because these bonds aren't going to add linearly. I can still calculate those energies exactly, but there's not a factor of two between them. So you have to calculate, you can't add, you can't use this table and add stuff directly. You can't say, oh, two single bonds, that's the same as a double bond. You have to use the double bond in oxygen. Some other interesting things. Here's carbon, carbon bond. And I have 348 there, uh, triple bond, double bond. And these energies, you can imagine there's many different kinds of carbon single bonds, carbon double bonds, and carbon triple bonds. These numbers are kind of averages over the many kinds of bonds. They're, they're, the, uh, they're, they're the numbers that give us the best results if we're calculating bonds breaking and bonds forming. These are not exact numbers for any particular type of uh, single, double, or triple bond. You can think of them as averages over many kinds of double and triple bonds. They're just kind of benchmarks. And often if you're, um, uh, you're, you're in the lab and you want to kind of de decide uh, quickly what a bond energy is or what a reaction energy is, and you don't have a table of uh, energies of formation, with just a few, you know, you could have this in your back pocket and organic chemists, uh, you know, they know these numbers uh, just because they use them so often. With just a few of these, you can calculate the energies for lots of reactions. Uh, and let's see how you would do that. First, let's do a chem quiz. I'm going to take a mole of carbon solid uh, in the diamond form. So it's got four carbons around it. Every carbon is surrounded by four other carbons. There's this other form, graphite. We're not going to talk about that one. 
So every carbon is surrounded by four carbon atom atoms, and that's that's done particularly uh, schematically here, um, syntactically here. That is, the structure of diamond is not flat and planar, but you have the same topology. Every carbon is connected to four other carbons. So that's a kind of a, just a topological re relationship. It's not a structural relationship there, but it's useful for this kind of thing. So if I'm going to atomize a mole of carbon atoms from carbon solid, how many moles of carbon-carbon bonds are broken? So think about that for a minute, and we'll take a vote. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, we're back. So let's see what Ryan uh, has in the um, in the uh, uh, chem quiz results vote now. If you have not yet, and Ryan, just routinely move that thing uh, to the center. Are are you uh, and your PowerPoint's kind of messed up? or Are we going to see it? Okay, let's see what you're thinking. Uh, again, across the board. So uh, it's Monday. Um, everybody's trying to decide what to do. Uh, both one, two, and three are uh, popular. So, or A, B, and C are popular. Let me give you my thinking on that. So we're breaking all the carbon-carbon bonds in diamond. So let's look at all the carbon-carbon bonds in diamond. If I have to create a lattice, a structure, in this case, diamond structure of carbons where every carbon is bonded to four other carbons, rather than breaking it, let's think about how you would make it. So there's a carbon atom, and I'm going to put two bonds uh, next to that, and then I'm going to continue doing that. There's another carbon, and I'll put two bonds on that. There's another carbon, I'll put two bonds on that. And you notice if I keep doing that, I'll get this lattice. So any random carbon has four bonds to it. But by breaking two of them, I'm releasing, partially releasing the guys next to it. Every carbon can kind of be assigned two carbon bonds to it, not four. So you have to break two carbon-carbon bonds to release carbon atoms. Two moles of carbon-carbon bonds will release two moles of carbon atoms. So here's the molecular structure for uh, H, or what is the molecular structure for H2O2? If you can see Lonnie run this reaction. So let's see if we can have uh, Lonnie run that reaction. Go to the demo lab. So here's Lonnie. He's got hydrogen uh, peroxide here. He's going to add a catalyst. 
manganese oxide and a catalyst doesn't do anything to the energetics, the product and reactants. It just makes the reaction go faster. So he'll add that and there's the chemical reaction. You get the release of uh, energetic release of the, the reactants or the products. So with that in mind, oh, I already am here. I just have to stop the... Uh, Uh, the PowerPoint or the web. So what does that tell you? <clears throat> you saw the water and the oxygen being released when I performed that chemical reaction. What does it tell you about the structure? Can you infer something from the structure? Start talking about that in your breakout rooms. In the interest, uh, in the interest of uh, moving along here, uh, I'll just go through this with you because we're running behind. So, uh, what can I tell? Well, first of all, <laughs> quick chem quiz: uh, What happened in that chemical reaction? Uh, the water broke down. Did you notice whether it was endothermic or exothermic? It it was exothermic. It went with the vaporization of those uh, molecules, the release of heat. So knowing that it's exothermic, can I come up with a structure? Well, it turns out because if you break some bonds and make other bonds, you can do this whole thing where you can actually imagine this crazy thing that we've, we've imagined before. You want to know an energy difference, but you want to know an energy uh, difference for this. Here's what you do is, uh, well, first of all, let's, let's say the energy difference. So you have H2O2, and that decomposes into water and oxygen, and it's exothermic. So H2O and O2, the products have to be down here, OK? Now, how could I get from here to here? One way is to break everything into atoms and then recombine the atoms to form the products. Break all those bonds, form all those bonds. The bonds that I break go up in energy. The bonds that I form release energy. So if I take the... Uh, Bonds broken and bonds formed, the difference between those two is the enthalpy of the reaction. Because that's a state function, and it doesn't matter how you get there, break all the bonds, break all this bond, break this bond. As long as I end up here, I could have either just done the combustion and gone straight away, or the uh, decomposition, or I could have broken up everything to get here. That value of delta H is still de delta H for the reaction. So then you can say, well, let me look at the bonds. Here to do this, let's say I was this structure. Then I'd have two HO bonds to break. Over here, I have two HO bonds to form. And I would have to uh, form the O2 double bond. So if I say, well, those two cancel out. I'm breaking two O2 bonds if I'm kind of like this structure. I'm making two HO bonds to make the water. What I'm left with is making OO bonds. Well, how are the two O's held together here? Well, if this is a double bond, and that is a double bond, which they are. I'm breaking a mole of the double bonds here, but only forming a half of the double bonds there. So I'd have to break a whole mole of double bonds, but only make half a mole of oxygen-oxygen double bonds. So that has to be endothermic. I put a bunch of energy into break. I only make half as many bonds. 
So this structure is out. Break a whole mole, get half a mole. If it's a single bond and I form a double bond, single bonds easy to break, double bonds I go way down in energy when I form that, so it would be exothermic if that's a single bond. So, oops, A is the answer. So this is one of those questions where you have to draw a picture and you have to understand everything that's going on. Uh, that encompasses so much of what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. State functions, you can go any direction you want. If you break bonds, you have to put in energy. If you make bonds, you release energy. But I can take different pathways to get to the same point. Here, I just had to know if the overall reaction was endothermic or exothermic. And then I analyzed the bonds, break all these bonds, form all those bonds. What had to be the relationship between the bonds to get to that answer? That's probably a little... Um, too uh, complicated for uh, an exam question if we hadn't gone through it exactly like this so you could see the thinking. But now that you've seen the thinking, you can probably uh, uh, stick with that. <clears throat> so if you take reactants and you go to products and you have an enthalpy difference for those, you could imagine taking the reactants, breaking them all up into atoms, like we just did, and then forming the products for those atoms. And now these are enthalpy or reaction bond energies for breaking every single bond. And these are bond energies for making the product bonds. And you know what you're going to see? Delta H for that reaction is the sum of those two things. I could have gone this way or this way. They have to be the same because I end up at the same point. So I can take uh, the energies of all the reactants, subtract away all the energies of the product bond formations, and I'll get an enthalpy for the reaction. So let's, let's now weave in everything else we've done. Question. The question is, I said breaking bonds is always endothermic. So is making bonds always exothermic? Yes. Short answer. If it takes energy to do something in one direction, it takes the same amount of energy in reverse to do it in the other direction. This step here always goes up in energy. Breaking stuff into atoms always goes up in energy. This Taking atoms and forming products always goes down in energy. The difference between how much that goes up and how much that goes down is the difference between in energies between the products and reactants. That's what we want to know. So we're using these uh, sums. So let's change that from the reactants to the elements in their standard states. Ooh. <laughs> and say, well, if I'm going to take the elements in their standard states and go to atoms and products, then what is this reaction? What's delta H3 now? Elements in their standard states, making the products. That's the standard enthalpy of formation of the products. I went from the elements in their standard states to some compounds. That's this one now I can calculate from a table. So for this, we would put an enthalpy of formation for that now. So that says, oh, well, I could calculate enthalpies of formation from this process. Think about that for a minute and see if that's absolutely true. I know I can get enthalpies of formation by going to a table and take all the enthalpies of formation of the compounds here, add them together, and I get the enthalpies of formation of all the products. Is that in this case, the same in that direction? The answer is, well, theoretically, yes, because I end up at the same place, 
but in practice, is it the case? It's subtle, let me tell you. So here I'm going from reactants to products. If I go from elements to compounds, that is the case. That's the first change we did. So that's, a, that's an enthalpy of formation. Now, let's bring in some other compounds down here. I got to elements in their standard states. And I knew the elements in their standard states to make those compounds. Here's a different set of compounds, but I can know the, uh, that difference as well. Let's say I wanted to go from these compounds to those compounds. How would I get that? Well, I can look at the table, do my standard enthalpies of formation for this, and say I can go from there, make, take the elements in their standard state, make those compounds, and then do the chemical reaction. So I know, again, this is the same formula we had last time, that I can, if I want to know delta H red here, I can get that from enthalpy is the formation of the products minus enthalpy is the formation of the reactants. So I can sum all those as I've uh, written there. And now that's the enthalpy of formation of products simply because I've changed that to elements in their standard states. That changes these from reaction elements, you, re reaction enthalpies, you could say, to actual uh, enthalpies of formation. If I want to make this reaction go, I have to go up, then down. So that plus that. But if I go up, I have to change the sign. And I get back to the same formula I had last time. Delta H for this reaction is standard states for this reaction is enthalpies of formation of the products minus enthalpies of formation of the reactants. And in this case, it's the standard state enthalpy difference. If it's the standard state enthalpy difference, then all of those are in one molar and one atmosphere. All of those are in one molar and one atmosphere. So it may not be a real situation. This might not be what you would measure in the lab in your calorimeter because you wouldn't start, you certainly wouldn't probably start with all the products already there. You would take the reactants and go to products. So you could measure that one. We do this so we can rank them ahead of time. Rank every compound with respect to each other and see what the different enthalpies of the compounds in their standard states are. It always gives you a good indication of what's gonna happen. It tells you if a reaction is gonna be overall endothermic or exothermic. The exact number of joules might be different. So that's an important one. This is an important one. I can get this delta H, I can get delta H is two ways. I can take the uh, bond energies, break everything into atoms and go to the pop compounds. I could start with the elements in their standard states and go from compounds to elements in their standard states back to the reactant or product compounds. That's the same as going directly there. That gives me this. So that summarizes everything we need to know there. Now let's get back to that question of what about the what about the exact case where um, I'm just here. I want to know this the enthalpy for this standard state enthalpy for that reaction. Can I get it from going from here to here? Let's pose that as a chem quiz. Throw up uh, the counter there. This is just yes, no. Are these two things, if I go to my table and use the enthalpies of formation here to get that, and if I go to a different table and get the bonds broken minus bonds formed, then are those exactly the same number? So that's just a yes or no question. Think about that just for a second.
Hey, I'm back. Sorry, uh, we missed some of that. It turns out you guys voted exactly evenly for yes, they're the same, or no, they're not the same. And I know in your hearts, and I want it to be true in my hearts. <laughs> I only have one. I want it to be true in my heart. I knew you were an alien. <laughs> I have my secondary heart. You shoot me my heart, it doesn't matter because I've got the other heart. It continues to <laughs> supply bodily fluids. And it's not blood because I'm an alien. So anyway, you want that to be true because it's the energy difference here. And we keep saying it doesn't matter which pathway you go. And that is exactly true. But if you're going to do that, this has to be, this better be an exact number. And that better be an exact number. And then that would add to the exact number. But when you use bond energies, remember we use averages for a lot of bond energies. So these are wishy-washy approximations if you do that. So they're not the exact difference for the actual reaction because you said, oh, I had a carbon-carbon double bond. I had five of them. So five times a carbon-carbon double bond. But the carbon-carbon double bonds could have been all over the molecule. And they don't have exactly the same enthalpy for, or energy for breaking them. So we do take those averages. So these are averages. This is exact. So the answer is no. They would not be the same number. If you want to get an exact number, do it this way. If you're in the lab and you want to quickly jot it down this way, then do it. So we'll go back to saying, well, why the heck do we even do it this way? And the answer is, like I told you, with just a few in the back of your head numbers, what's a carbon-carbon double bond? What's a carbon single bond? What's an oxygen bond? What's an oxygen-hydrogen bond? Say five or six numbers, if you're an organic chemistry lab, where they're only going to use carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and you know uh, nitrogen, phosphorus. If you know just a couple of those, you can estimate these enthalpies of these reactions. For here, you need a table that's miles long, every single compound that could possibly exist. You can replicate that table in your head with just a couple numbers. Isn't exact, though. OK. Uh, do you know what slide number that is? So I can go to 31 without running through all the animations. Here are standard enthalpies of formation now. These are the exact numbers. And we saw last time how we took uh, iron oxide and aluminum and reacted them together. In fact, I think I, I, when we were talking about the Hindenburg at the end, uh, I think I was saying aluminum oxide and aluminum metal uh, interchangeably. And I was being pretty flippant. Uh, and I might have, I, I, I looked back myself. I didn't look at all of it, but I said, oops, you said aluminum oxide, the product, uh, and you called it the reactant. So um, that's, you know, one of those flubs. Luckily, that was after lecture. We were just, uh, we were just chatting. But there are those numbers. With that in mind, what do you think about this? So, well, you don't even need that. Well, no, no, no. You could, you could use everything, everything we've shown you. So, what is delta H standard kilojoules per mole per mole for this reaction? So, it's a reaction where I break some bonds and I form some bonds. What is delta H for that reaction? So, start the poll if you would. I'll give you those tables, bond enthalpies, standard enthalpies of formation. Think about that. You've got the thing in front of you. I will drop into a breakout room. So have you put me in a, a new room?
Hey, breakout room nine. Marvin and May and Kara and Antoinette. I love it. Anybody want to say something this morning? Ivan? Can you hear me? I'm unmuted. Hey, Nicholas. What are you thinking? Um, first, I'm a little confused because it says you start with four carbon-carbon double bonds and then you end with one. Oh, no, never mind. Um, yeah, you're going from products to reactants, so it's, it's likely you won't have the same number and kind. Okay, I'm back. Um, I might have had my mic on talking to the breakout room. I uh, apologize if you were getting uh, any feedback. It really would have only affected the uh, breakout room I was in. So let's see what you're thinking. Ryan has a number for us. It's hidden. Uh, pretty equal between, uh, A and B, uh, the C's not so much, uh, <laughs> the C's are going to be psyched. I think, oh no, which one is it? It's uh, that's not, is that for the, that is methanol. Oh, it is not C. Sorry. Um, uh, I've tried to build a molecule in my head. So, uh, we'll go back to my screen here. And I want to say, first off, you had this reaction, and you could have said, well, to get this reaction to go, I have to break those bonds, break those bonds, break those bonds, and make that bond, those bonds, and those two bonds. Oops, the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen isn't there, sorry. But that's five carbon-hydrogen bonds. And that would work. That would get you an estimate. Uh, you can be fiendishly clever in this case and say, well, this molecule you're ending up, which is your product, there's not a whole heck of a lot of things that can be. It has one carbon-carbon bond and then five carbon-hydrogen bonds. So you could kind of even start to draw that out. Where... I have to use my finger. Oh. You can kind of start to draw that out. This thing... It's only got one carbon-carbon bond in it. It has five carbon-hydrogen bonds. It has one 
carbon oxygen bond and it has one oxygen hydrogen bond. So that's what you're going to form probably. I don't think there's any other way you can arrange that. You're going to make ethanol. And what are these? Anybody recognize those? Those are the elements in their standard states. So you're going from the elements in their standard state, elemental oxygen O2, elemental hydrogen H2, carbon-carbon solid bonds. So what is the enthalpy of this reaction? The standard state enthalpy for that reaction. Well, it's the standard state enthalpy of formation of ethanol. Elements in their standard state to ethanol. Now, you could have done it with your uh, bonds broken minus bonds form thing. You would not have gotten exactly one of these numbers. But if you do it this way, one of those numbers, as you recall, just go through the animations there, those elements in their standard state, so that's ethanol. If you recall, Standard uh, enthalpy of formation of ethanol is there, 278 kilojoules per mole. Amazing. So there I'm just being, you know, I'm just being coy and clever again. But just to drive home the force, the fact that there's more than one way to cook an egg this is exactly like we, what we just talked about. You could do this by breaking and forming everything, or you could have just recognized, I know you're, you're freshman and you're not like thinking at that higher level. You could have just recognized that's the enthalpy of formation of ethanol, elements in their standard states to a compound. Did not expect you to get that. I was just being clever to drive home this point. I'll call myself clever. You can call me whatever you'd like. Okay, uh, that's about it for today. So thank you for joining us and spending a few extra minutes. Uh, are there any pressing questions? Uh, formal class is over. Is smiling, which means there's some snide comments, but no actual questions. Is there a comment you want to? Share. <clears throat> um, can we do this chem quiz question since I have it up? Um, uh, well, uh, uh, well, yes, I can do it. <laughs> Will I do it? Um, I'll do it tomorrow. I, I, it's one that I want you to uh, think about. I want to talk about it together, and not everybody's probably here now. Um, this is exciting because it goes back to the first day of class. See you tomorrow.